past our meeting, so I just have to tell someone up on the sixth floor, and they can then that little camera there. Don't worry, it doesn't like do close-ups. There it goes. So oh, there it goes. Okay, hey, nod. I love it when they nod. It's kind of freaky sometimes. I'll say, "Are you guys filming?" And the camera nods. Hey, good morning, everyone. Sao Chang Hao. Um, most of you are kind of China Environment Forum Mafia, but just in case we've got a few newbies in the room, my name is Jennifer Turner, and I've been directing the China Environment Forum for 10 years, a decade. It's, it's rocking. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I um, want to welcome you here for um, one of our, our first meeting of the, well, the Western New Year. We're, you know, as I noted in my email, that this meeting is sandwiched right in between the, the Western and the Chinese New Year. So this is my one time where I can use my only Cantonese sentence. Gong hei fa choi. Happy New Year. Xin nian kuai le. Year of the ox coming down the pike here. And I, and I did think, you know, when I was originally conceptualizing, it was kind of catalyzed by Dan Gutman, who just happened to be dropping into town for a month, that, um, that it actually was a very good time to kind of think about some of the past trends in environmental laws and regulations, because there was actually a lot of action going on in China. You know, the National People's Congress and Ministry of Environmental Protection were really busy last year. A lot of new regulations and I thought it was a, it was a good time to kind of reflect on what has happened and really think about what does this mean in the year of the ox coming up that we have all these new somewhat progressive sounding laws and regulations, a lot of revisions of laws. So, so, so we're going to try to hopefully today dig a little deeper and, and the title of course is Mind the Gap because that was the whole reason for a lot of the revisions of the laws because earlier laws, particularly the water pollution control law, had it was like a sieve, to use a pun there. Um, yeah, so, um, and, and, and also one thing I, you know, I wanted to note, maybe it sounds kind of schmaltzy, but last night as I was thinking about this meeting, I was realizing how lucky I am to be having this job because I, I get, I mean, I've, over 10 years, I don't know, get kind of schmaltzy after 10 years, but just thinking about how I've been very lucky to, to bring to D.C. a lot of government NGO business researcher folks from, from China and around the world and, and who are really interested in, in, you know, exploring cooperation with China on environment and energy issues. And then also super lucky because I've gotten to become friends with a lot of these folks. And, you know, and, the, and, you know, and Tad's the, you know, all three of these guys have become my friends over the years, really helping me out with a lot of my work, as a lot of you in the audience do, too. Um, so... <laughs> What we're going to do today, we're going to, and we're going to switch the order, but I'll introduce Tad, even though he's, he, he'll be here shortly. I think, I think he's probably stuck. Hopefully he's not on the red line. That was, it's been kind of bad this week. Um, Tad Ferris, and we'll have to remind him when he comes, he actually would probably get the Frequent Speaker Award for the China Environment Forum. I mean, not only because he's, you know, he's local, uh, but he's, he's very gracious in giving his time, and he also has just an incredible knowledge of on-the-ground things that are happening in China on, on their laws because he's helped to write a lot of them. And if you can get him privately, he can tell you great anecdotes about government bureaucrats and really funky things going on. So he's, he's, a, very, he's a very fun speaker, too. Um, he's a partner at Holland and & Knight, and he's a principal with their China team. And he's got about 15 years' experience in working with the Chinese government, multinationals, and, and businesses in China on, on a whole broad range of environmental laws. So he's basically, he's, he's really one of my first go-to guys for environmental law. And then there's Dan Gutman, who's just overall one of my go-to guys who's not in the States. He's, he's in China a lot of times. Um, he's a man with many hats. On the bio you have, it notes that he's a lawyer and a teacher. But I want to add on there that, I didn't add it there physically, but he's also a, like me, he's like, you're, you know, Dan, you're a matchmaker. <laughs> that you like bring... In the worst sense. Yeah. In the worst sense. No, but, but try, really, you know, he, he, I met him back in 2003 when he was preparing to go do a Fulbright, did two-year Fulbright teaching at, like, five different universities, like Tsinghua, Be Beijing, Fudan, Nanjing, and Shanghai Jiao Tong University, teaching environmental law classes. And that kind of, I believe, set the foundation for him to stay. And now he is he's a visiting professor at Peking University School of Law, Public Interest Law Program, very long title, and a fellow at Tsinghua University's China America, China America Center. So, you know, so he's, he's got, you know, very ensconced in, in the law community, but he also is, I think, you're a board member of at least one NGO that I know of, the Roots and Shoots. And, and just really, no, so sometimes when I have really kind of obscure questions looking for kind of person that I can't find anywhere else in my network, I just email Dan and he helps me find folks. Um, and then there's Steve Wolfson, um, who is a, also a good buddy, neighbor here over in Ariel Rios, and that he's a senior attorney with the International Environmental Law Practice Group at EPA's G Office of General Counsel. And um, he co-coordinates EPA's International Environmental Law and Enforcement Training Team. So it's really, again, very applied, training lawyers in, in Asia and Africa and Latin America on environmental law. 
And his work, I think you're, it's so funny, it's like he probably does like three jobs like everyone in EPA. Um, but, you know, it, <laughs> one little piece of him, increasingly larger piece, is working with the Chinese on environmental law and is trying to help form a partnership between the All-China Lawyers Association's Energy and Natural Resource Committee and the American Bar Association on um, Center, Section on Environmental Law and Resources Law. And then he's also been in, in charge of the um, General Counsel's Initiative on Environmental Law Cooperation. They've got a website, good information, so go there. So I'm going to stop talking. Do you guys want to know who's out in the audience? Is that helpful to you? One thing I will do, I will take the microphone, and I don't want like long history. I just want, if you give me your name and affiliation real quick so they know who they're talking to, real zippy, and then we'll have plenty of time for them to give their talks and for Q&A. So just real quick. Dan Mitterhoff, uh, like everybody else, doing multiple jobs. Two affiliations, Central University of Finance and Economics in Beijing, University of Maryland School of Law in Baltimore. Uh, Ken Lieberthal, normally at University of Michigan, this year at the Brookings Institution. <laughs> Helen Rafael, Resources for the Future. Uh, Sarah Wegmiller, Environmental Law Institute. Bob O'Connor, National Science Foundation. Kristen Igeski, SAIC. Erica Skull, um, American University Global Environmental Politics student and former intern here. Wen Yu Shu, um, Tsinghua University School of Law, now uh, a legal, a legal intern in RDC. Dan Klotz, Pew Charitable Trusts. Corey Buffo, EPA. Brenda Johnson, EPA. Chen Plan, EPA. Todd Kaiser, I'm a senior at UC Berkeley, and I am a spring intern. Well, Yong Kun Liu, I'm a, I'm a master's student at American University, and I'm an intern here. Christina Larson, Washington Monthly. Lee Lefkowitz, U.S. China Economic and Security Review Commission. Scott McKenzie, grad student at Columbia University and a program assistant at Earth Institute. Lisa Hook, also a grad student at Columbia University. Susan Brown with the US EPA Enforcement Office. Bob Kenny, EPA. Oh, Cheryl Wasserman, Environmental Protection Agency, um, Office of Enforcement. Jen Lee, uh, I'm a Whitney Scholar from China, and I'm doing my intern in EPA now. I didn't know that. Gary Waxmanski, <laughs> EPA, International Affairs. I'm Bill Sontag with US EPA, the Office of the Chief Information Officer. There seems to be some tribal behavior with the EPA today, doesn't it? <laughs> Cassie Stevenson, I'm a master's student at American University and an intern here at the Wilson Center. Paul Hoff, um, Garvey, Schubert, and Bear, and um, I've just completed uh, working on a project on the China uh, environmental laws as they apply to the steel industry in particular. Oh, no, no, Paul. Yeah, yeah, Paul, yeah. Comes Dave Gravelisi, another person yeah, yeah. from EPA. I'm from the Office of General Counsel. Erwin Rose, Department of State, Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science. Lauren Withy with the World Resources Institute. Uh, Nat Green, Social Science Research Council, Council's uh, China Environment and Health Initiative. I'm Xi Gang, American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative. Xi Gang. Uh, Erping Huangfu, U.S. Department of Energy uh, Policy and International Affairs. Darcy Nelson, U.S. Forest Service International Programs. Steve Randolph, National Defense University. Kristen Wilcox, the World Bank Safeguard Secretariat for East Asia Pacific. Uh, Jeremy Schreifels, US EPA and Tsinghua University. Sarah Sol, US EPA Office of Air and Radiation. Zach Friedman, law student at Temple University. Lyndon Ellis, Woodrow Wilson Center China Environment Forum. My partner in crime, my assistant. And then, oh, and then, and just, hand just hand it up. Well, the nice. Maybe you can pass around. To see, now it's good that we went around the room because ends up Ted whispered to me, evidently the inauguration blockades and things are already starting and he got caught in the web. <laughs> so, but that's why we, we were, I introduced you, I said nice things about him, right? I basically said that, Ted, you get the frequent speaker card, 
for the China Environment What's Forum. Oh, I'm so sorry. What, will, do you want to do it on camera now? Or you, <laughs> I was like, it was more gratitude. Oh, my God, you came. <laughs> no, just... It was relief that I had made it through. Yes. Um, in Luli, um, with Nat Nat Natural Resource Defense Council, Tsinghua University. Okay. Yeah, and Todd, can you get the mic from her and then we'll and use it for the Q&A? Okay, we're going to just start because more people will be coming in and we got to get going so we have time for the Q&A. So, Tad, you just came in the door. Yes. You were introduced. I said you were great. I'm chilled. I'm ready. I'm frustrated from traffic. but. <laughs> okay, can everyone take a deep inhalation? I'm a yoga teacher. How, actually, a lot of people here are my yoga students, too. It's <laughs> another story. Tad Ferris? Oh. Oh. Oh, Tad. Oh. Ah, <laughs> Who ah, came and switched them? Confused the Tron. Yes. <laughs> here we go. Thank you. Oh, I think initially he was supposed to be here. Good. Thanks, Helen. Attention to detail. But I do want to note one thing is, for those of you that are new and noting going around the room, we have a very diverse crowd here, right? And I, I do like doing the yes. introductions when we're not obscenely large. So you all get to know each other and do a lot of schmoozing and networking afterwards. Tad, you've had Thank three you. or four breaths. I didn't hear the introduction, but um, <laughs> we're uh, typically... For folks that know me, um, uh, I spend, I think this is the almost getting into the, the third decade of work related to the environment in China. Um, we can talk about the anecdotes where it started, how I was splashed on the Denshui River with water, how my skin blistered up, how I went to the <laughs> hospital, how I said something's got to be done. So it has, uh, it has a palpable beginning. I, I uh, did say that you were... at that time, but it was definitely... Something used to be done. Um, my colleague who joined me from the Chinese government, many of you may know, um, Zhang Hongjun, um, who we're still, as Jennifer likes to call it, partners in crime, but actually partners, you know, hoping to help people understand uh, the environmental issues better, help comply with laws, um, which is often in many countries challenging, but in China, um, as you all know, sometimes finding the law is, is a challenge. Um, Indeed, some other issues we can talk about, including our effort to halt the copywriting of laws so we can get them out there into the public. But uh, that aside, I wanted to give an overview today of some general trends. A lot of these draw from our, our work. You'll see specific examples of these. You'll hear specific examples of some of these trends. We can talk about them later, but I wanted to give a, this sort of 5,000 foot, sometimes it gets a little lower, um, but overview before we went into some of our detailed discussions today. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about general regulatory trends. These affect um, what we understand about the environmental sector. Uh, many of them, you know, are very, very much evident in the environmental area. Uh, I work also in safety and uh, in other areas, but uh, I wanted to give that more general view and then specifically look at some of the environmental um, legal trends. Uh, many of these will come as no surprise. For example, for a slide, uh, an emphasis on legislative drafting and rulemaking rather than implementation. Now, many of these are generalizations, and I'll talk about the exceptions to that, which are, are very promising and we should take note of, definitely. Um, uh, uh, there is still within the culture and many of the agencies related lawmaking bodies, um, uh, as Dan and others will talk about, this planning culture, but also a sense that drafting is very important. And if you get through your drafting agenda, your rulemaking agenda, your legislative agenda, um, this is also reflected in your um, personnel review. This is something you get kudos for. I think the important thing is to find out a means to help that cultural shift towards a, look, law not implemented at all or complied with at all, you know, that needs to be something that needs to be discussed as well. And indeed it is, but, um, and, and I'll talk about that later. Um, uh, and, and this is because of a, a development very recently of limited, though welcome, uh, government initiatives aimed at assessing how laws are implemented. That kind of thing is what is very promising to me, and I'll give some examples of that. Um, uh, also, we'll note, and not surprising, this happens everywhere, uh, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but the creation of uniquely Chinese approaches in the regulatory programs. They reflect characteristics of significant international initiatives, you know, initiatives from their export markets like the European 
uh, union, you'll see a lot of those picked up, changed a bit, and implemented in China, or at least the at the start of a regulatory planning program, they say we need to do something uh, related to the evaluation of chemicals because Europe is that's a significant export market. That may be the start of things, but then it will evolve because of the Chinese legal system, administrative system, uh, into something that's uh, fairly uniquely Chinese. Uh, there are other characteristics we can talk to as well that affect how they develop regulatory pro programs. One of these that's been quite evident recently because of the product quality crisis is an extreme aversion to uh, product quality crisis, I should say, plus the fact that the compliance culture is still evolving. There is a definite tendency for the regulatory authorities to be averse to self-governance kind of approaches. You know, if you're going to submit as an enterprise, for example, a self-declaration of conformity, they'll want to verify that test and then also perhaps certify that everything you said was correct. It won't be one of those will, and some of this is a resource infrastructure related issue, it won't be a situation where they'll say, well, in our law we'll put that we can inspect you at any time and if we find a bad uh, actor, a bad apple in the bunch, uh, we will enforce against that uh, entity uh, very vigorously. It is typically not that kind of approach. It's a, at least aspirationally, a check every box, um, at least have that in the law and in the system. Uh, and sometimes that creates problems in terms of compliance because obviously that's, that's a great resource drain. Um, there is a, and, and reflecting that is the next point here where there is a preference for mandatory pre-market testing, that kind of thing. You'll see more and more of those kind of programs up. Indeed, one just went into place with regard to certification of conformity with international transport rules. So they're not only to confirm conformity with Chinese laws, but also to confirm conformity where China participates in an international program with international requirements. Um, also, not surprisingly, a continued mission creep among the national level agencies. Uh, environmental issues are very, very much in vogue, and I'm not saying that to disparage this kind of a this kind of a mission creep, but it does create complexities and confusion uh, when it comes to governance. If uh, for any one particular issue, a number of agencies are involved, it may be a you know multiple agencies. It may be that an agency you never thought would be involved is involved. A good example of this shifting mission creep is with their waste electrical and electronic product uh, recycling program. Um, it's often referred to as China We because it, its start, as I mentioned before, was the fact that the European Union is, has put in place a We directive to govern the take back and recycling of these products. Uh, this is still draft in China, but the ball keeps changing as to what agency will be implementing this. Interestingly, it, the lead was the National Development Reform Commission. Very recently, it looks like the Ministry of Environmental Protection may actually take the lead on implementing at least this law, which will eventually come out from the State Council. So while that seems to be moving towards more the Environmental Protection admin, um, uh, Ministry, it is not always the case. You will have the Ministry of Commerce initiating environmental um, rulemaking activities, Administration for Quality, Supervision, Inspection, and Quarantine, the Port Authority, also the Governing Authority for their Standards Administration, for their Certification Authorities, involved in many, um, I would say, environment-related activities. Ministry of Health, increasingly, uh, uh, all of these agencies uh, are assisting with this. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a heightened sensitivity over product quality, um, uh, and I, I wanted to jump to this because it, it's been very interesting to see how the effect of this on the marketplace in China. Many, as you've probably seen in the news, if you haven't even been following this closely, many enterprises are shutting down. Many of these small, smaller supplier shops, etc., are shutting down, and there's a growing awareness that, well, you know, they didn't have one iota of a compliance culture. Um, they basically ignored these safety rules. They ignored, say, they ignored environmental rules as well. Um, they ignored rules in general um, in terms of that 
to have that sense of stricture. Why, for example, um, uh, even getting down beyond law to why, if there's a uh, contract with specifications that says, okay, in China, the lead content rules may be subject specific. In other words, lead would be restricted for toys, but lead might not be restricted for something else, you know, like a, an industrial uh, container, for example. Why is important if the specifications say for this, do not use um, uh, a um, mixing machine that has been used at all for uh, lead-based paint, why that's important to pay attention to. You don't just wash it out and then throw in another batch of non-lead containing paint. Um, it's interesting to watch how that will shift um, uh, in terms of the government's push for these smaller entities and medium-sized entities to develop compliance cultures as they've tried to push with regard to their larger state-owned enterprises. It wasn't that long ago, actually, that they issued a rule that required that the state-owned enterprises establish the Office of General Counsel. Before that, there was no requirement. You could have no legal um, entity within your um, state-owned enterprise. You know, So talk about difficulty in infusing the organization with a compliance culture if you have not even, don't even have lawyers um, at all involved in the process, it's no wonder. And it's not surprising for those that have followed the history, obviously, uh, because this is still something um, in terms of a move uh, um, and ev evolution within the sense of, you know, the role of lawyers and, and what they're responsible for and the fact that they're not only involved in disputes, which I think is something that is challenging. I still get the question often when I'm there, if I don't put on an academic hat, I put the legal hat, what are you doing here? We're not involved in a lawsuit. You know, that kind of sense, which is unusual because many of the places I've been in Asia, there are pe many individuals with legal educations. The bar pass rates may be very, very low, but the law school participation is very high. Maybe the other f folks can comment on that. But um, uh, some other of the regulatory trends I, I'd, I'd focus on is, you know, with, with some great applause that there's been a focus on government capacity building and internal intergovernmental investigations in, in, in the, with regard to compliance with laws. You know, there's still challenges with regard to infrastructure, personnel, uh, political um, um, compromises that, that frustrate some of these uh, enforcement activities, but there is more and more of not only a look at the regulated community, but also looking at the administrative bodies and saying, look, you just enforce nothing. We need to fix that. And, and you may have seen in the news um, as well, especially if you follow the Chinese news, um, reports, not just internal PR, but reports that really show that they're, um, they're very free-handed with some of their sanctions uh, against the administrative bodies that are enforcing laws. I want to push through some environmental law trends quickly uh, so we have a, uh, a little breathing room f um, at the end of this. but. Uh, obviously, there's an enormous uh, focus in China on waste controls, um, particularly new measures governing the import, export, um, and domestic management of hazardous waste. Uh, this is no surprise ever since the Basel Action Network report that caught the Chinese officials you know, fairly by surprise, interestingly, but there were many internal reports uh, that highlighted the fact that you've got, you know, very problematic dismantling operations in Guayu and other locations. There's a lot of this waste that ends up in China. Um, and the activities are against Chinese law, whereas the enforcement. I think that was the thing that caused the greatest action. It wasn't that they needed to implement a law. They would have mm -hmm. done that fairly quickly. But the fact that this was already um, violating a number of Chinese laws, uh, that caught them great, great surprise. But also in the rulemaker fashion, they said, well, if they're not paying attention to those laws, let's issue a whole host of new laws. Um, that's why you see this tendency, it's an interesting characteristic, where you can tell often if you monitor laws coming out very closely from the various agencies, um, which you know, is one of my more bizarre <laughs> personal pastimes. <laughs> um, 
but you'll see things like, you know, you see the major law, you know, it'll be some kind of um, management methods on, on the restriction of hazardous waste transfer. But then after a while, you may see circular on strengthening management of ha the laws on hazardous waste transfer. And then you'll see something like interpretive letter or opinions on um, vigorously implementing the, you know, and you'll see that almost that repetitive fashion. These will be shorter documents later on, but they will, you'll, you'll see, you know, we really mean it. Um, and sometimes those will have effect, but you can see that, that tendency um, uh, which is an interesting attribute of, of the legal system. Uh, there's a great expansion of product labeling programs, particularly those addressing energy efficiency labeling. Those are, uh, uh, there is a new host of governing, um, uh, for example, computer monitors, et cetera, that are coming out uh, that are enforced um, as March this year um, uh, for certain of the products. Uh, energy, obviously, is one of the greatest uh, energy efficiency, energy conservation. Obviously, uh, that hits at the heart of a lot of what uh, China is thinking of in terms of economic objectives, so it will be very much a priority um, uh, in the coming year. Uh, increased environmental oversight of companies that are publicly listed. That's an interesting program that the Ministry of Environmental Protection has initiated with the Securities Exchange Commission, etc., that really says if you're going to be publicly listed and participate in that glorious entrepreneurship that we want you to also make sure that you, we review, we are able to review your environmental compliance record. Uh, enhanced provisions supporting citizen suits aimed at re re redressing environmental harms. You'll look at their water pollution prevention law, other amended laws that have come out recently that greatly strengthened um, provisions. We had a talk recently just last month with um, some of the attorneys who work that I know uh, that this group has um, spoken to in the past, Wong San Fa and others, who work um, in a legal clinic fashion with the communities um, to help them um, uh, pursue legal actions to redress environmental uh, harms that they've, um, they've suffered. And interestingly, although the numbers are still very frustrating, uh, some of the things that, it look, that I look at that are very positive um, and I can share some of the records of their, in English or Chinese, depending on what you want, of their, their recent um, lawsuits. The things that are very positive are the facts that judges are now willing to entertain a lot of these claims in terms of uh, even uh, emotional harms and other harms, things that, the concepts that are, were previously just rejected because of the challenging nature of a lot of these environmental cases in terms of causation, other issues. Um, uh, there's also been, uh, r to our great relief on, the, on those seeking information, the clarification of the nature of environmental information that the Ministry of Environmental Protection can make public. They've actually listed it out. You can almost in saying, these are the things we can give you. Um, uh, previously, as you know, you know, back to the anecdote side of things, uh, it's still a challenge in terms of access to law, not just because they copyright standards or things of that nature or they don't put everything on the web. And indeed, that is improving greatly, particularly with the original language documents. Uh, the fact that draft laws, however, the administrative regulatory system in China doesn't provide for notice and comment in a, in a very specific manner. The fact that draft laws still could be considered um, uh, government secrets. That's something I always warn people about. You know, usually it just goes on passing it around, but if ever they wanted to make an issue of it, indeed they can and they have. Uh, vice ministers have been sacked because of releasing um, draft laws when it wasn't allowed. Yes, it's very laudable that you do see, for example, draft laws in the People's Daily, which is an extremely public vehicle for dissemination. But what happens is after that goes back into the system and they make changes and everything, you may never see that again until it's final. So it's, it's still some ways to go for transparency. Um, always no, harken back to my anecdote about when I asked my friend at the then National Environmental Protection Agency to send me a standard because I didn't have time to go meet up with him um, after, after our initial meeting to discuss an issue. And he said, sure, I'll just paw, hop it in the mail, no problem. The Postal Administration refused to send it abroad because they say that we cannot send Chinese laws 
outside the country. And of course, my friend who is still, for those that know Biet Hall at the now the Ministry of Home Protection is, uh, um, Administration, would have none of that. Um, but he's a rare person that would yeah. take that on. Um, but it just shows that that culture. There's still in some areas very, very strong. Um, training programs, uh, including those for soil and groundwater contamination identification. So you see that kind of that nature that we're getting you ready. We don't have a legal program yet, but we're getting you ready to understand the nature of uh, remediation of soil and groundwater pollution, those kind of things. They're very active in those areas. Chemicals um, provisions, um, they're adding uh, missing listings to the China inventory of existing chemical substances, things that they know were in use in China prior to the effective date of the new chemical substance uh, management law. Uh, they're also redrafting their chemical substance management laws. Obviously, a lot of focus on chemicals. Um, expansion of government green procurement programs. There's a green procurement program and a separate energy efficient product procurement program uh, using those vehicles to promote um, environmental design of products. Uh, rapid, rapid development of what is often referred to as reduce, reuse, recycle, our 3R programs, including packaging controls. Packaging, you know, harkens back just like the plastic bag issue evolved after a while from the local levels. Moon cake packaging, you know, you still see, believe it or not, you have been. Um, the officials <laughs> decry, oh, look at this ridiculous packaging. Four moon cakes, this much packaging. <laughs> uh, they haven't been to my seen some of my friends' packages in Japan, but but still, um, it is something that launched almost this whole sense that packaging is something they need to address. There are now drafts out for national packaging legislation. There are local agency drafts out for excessive packaging legislation. We're going to see that as a, as a big focus in the coming uh, year. Um, there's... Um, Again, we all know there's environmental impact assessment program. It's one of the most longstanding and one of the ones that China, the Chinese focus on still. But they're expanding that model out to do safety impact assessment, health impact assessment. Now you have energy evaluation as well that is fairly modeled on the same approach of requiring pre, you know, at least for new projects or if you're expanding your project or making significant technical additions to your um, to your facility, basically, um, that there are certain approvals that should be um, undertaken. Uh, for many of us, due to our hearts also, growth in non-governmental organization campaigns focused uh, as well on the disclosure of enterprise violations of Chinese environmental laws. Some of these have been extremely effective, especially those on websites where you can just go and indeed larger corporations are now looking on there to see if their suppliers are listed um, uh, and using that to go and have a very serious talk with them. Um, but this whole host of transparency laws that are coming out in China um, is creating an interesting movement in that way. And I say when I talk to the officials, that also they're still struggling with some of that because here's a government in which everything was secret, so usually we didn't worry as much unless it was an accident of some sort with a clerical accident, that kind of thing, that they would all release a lot of information. But now they're struggling with this, okay, we have, we're being pushed to be transparent, uh, but we must also protect confidentiality. So they're, they're still um, struggling with where to draw the lines there, uh, and different agencies will have um, uh, different approaches to that. Uh, I talked about um, impact assessment. There is an increase in environmental litigation, definitely also product quality litigation, uh, not surprisingly. Um, uh, indeed, I think there were four or five pages of uh, litigation-related news stories from China just on the milk, the tainted milk issue. Um, uh, uh, there's also, I would say, generally a growth in citizen, a large concern over environmental issues in the community. Yes, there are more difficult and um, economic times, but if you speak to these individuals, this is also just like the blisters on my skin after that dragon boat ride. Um, this is something very palpable to many of them, and there is increasing opportunity through the NGOs, others that are working on these issues, uh, to really understand uh, that this is something they can change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tad. And if you could, if you could bring up um, Steve's PowerPoint, there's the other PowerPoint there, and then hand him the little remote. So, all right. 
good overview. It wasn't just at 5,000 feet. Went dipped down a few times. But again, Q&A. Ask for anecdotes. <laughs> we'll start with, um, we'll just move straight on to Steve. We'll go through all three and then have the Q&A, okay? Well, thanks, Jennifer. And um, it's, it's wonderful to be here and Happy New Year. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm sort of, it, it's a strange place to be sitting because I'm up here with some of my best teachers on uh, Chinese environmental issues uh, right here um, at the podium and also uh, around the room. Um, but uh, I just want to mention, you know, when we did the introductions, there were a bunch of EPA people here. Yeah. I, and it's, it's amazing. Did you Jennifer, plant them here? Like, no, 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 no. It's amazing that, that Jennifer's not also getting a salary for EPA because cause Jennifer and Lyndon hey. and the rest of your crew here have really helped us, I think, at least it really helped me and I think other folks to understand better what's going on in China in terms of the environment. And That's why um, we were created to help yeah. not just EPA, but everybody. Helping everybody else too. So this is, this is a wonderful forum for that. I started coming here before I even started working on China um, just to learn about what's going on. And um, it's been a terrific resource, I think, for all of us. Um, well, I'm going to play, play around a little bit with uh, Jennifer's gap metaphor because there are a number of different gaps that we could talk about um this is a this is a fun picture of you know celebrating this was from before the olympics but celebrating the olympics um and Steve, let me interject for people online we do have these powerpoints online just want sorry just want to make sure in case they didn't see that continue <laughs> so you know the image here is is a very happy image also a very kind of natural uh, image in in a way um and also you know you feel pretty safe looking at this. Frolicking, Frolicking yes. Um, but, you know, and this is, of course, the image uh, that, that China has promoted and that China has wanted. Um, and then there's sort of this counter image that emerged of uh, uh, when you look behind the wall, uh, you see that there's actually also been a lot of destruction in the name of economic growth. Um, and, you know, there's been protests, there's been the product scandals, so you have this counter image at the same time. So one of the gaps here is this gap between uh, image and uh, reality, or maybe I should call it between aspiration and uh, 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 some of the things that are actually going on. And you see it also in terms of pollution, um, you know, which has been portrayed in the media as really verging on an environmental crisis and th that's one of the debates you know you could have here just like the debate about is there an environmental movement in China is there an environmental crisis in China um, uh, so there's that gap between sort of image and reality uh, it certainly got people's attention around the world uh, on this issue of China's environment um, certainly got our attention so uh, there's been you know I would say multiple drivers for the US to pay more attention to China's environment. Um, <clears throat> one that I, you know, and of course, you know, it includes the scrutiny coming from the Olympics. It includes uh, the World Bank looking at the economic impacts of uh, pollution in China. It includes growing concern in China about the environment. Um, and that also includes here in the U.S. the strategic economic dialogue um, as one of the drivers. Uh, and what I would emphasize about the, the SED, uh, you know, which was kind of a high high-level engagement across a range of issues, uh, but included a framework on uh, energy and environment. Um, and I think what's, what's critical there is recognizing environment as a critical, strategic, and economic issue for the United States, China's environment. Um, that, I think, is, is sort of a new feature that really crystallized around the uh, SED. Um, what's the future of the SED? We don't know. Uh, I, it, it strikes me that the idea of high-level engagement and deep engagement with China on the environment is not a partisan issue. It's not a personal issue. It's the, the reasons for it remain. Um, but what we don't really know is kind of what shape it would take, what form it would take in the future. Uh, so that's one of the unknowns. In terms of the evolution of environmental law, just sort of a quick comparison. Um, you know, one way of describing environmental law in the U.S. is evolving from first controlling pollution and remedying past uh, contamination. And then in the 80s, that was in the 70s. In the 80s, you know, 70s really when we got started for real. 
uh, in the 80s, assessing and managing risks was the main theme. In the 90s, pollution prevention was a big theme. And maybe it's too soon to write the history of this decade, but uh, one way to look at it is uh, perhaps we're making a shift to a focus on sustainability. Um, China, of course, has this much greater challenge of trying to do all of these in the same, at the same time. Uh, so they've got that really compressed time frame. This is another sort of uh, picture on the, uh, the gap between uh, image and reality. Uh, this is the brochure that I saw in the taxi um, in China. Very, uh, you know, blue sky, uh, clean water. Um, clearly, uh, it's, it's really kind of aspirational. Um, and then this is the reality of what you actually see when you're there, what I actually saw when I was there. And I did sort of a non-scientific survey. I went back and looked at my pictures across about a half dozen different cities that I was in. I couldn't find any that had blue sky that were in a city, uh, but I did find some when we got out of the city that had blue sky. Um, and of course, there's the controversy about you know the blue sky days and are <laughs> the are the numbers real and and what do the numbers really mean? We have an article in the next China Environment series that goes into great detail on that, so we'll answer that question. <laughs> So this is one of the gaps uh, also is between in, in environmental law and policy uh, on the books and then uh, implementing it. And hopefully that's part of how you get from the, the dirty picture to the, to the clean picture. Um, China's environmental laws, uh, they, they have drafted a lot uh, over the years. Um, some of the challenges uh, that we see as we look at those laws um, are, are the mandates in the laws clear, or are they drafted more as aspirations? Um, are there implementing mechanisms? Wang San Fa from the Center for Legal Assistance to Pollution Vic Victims has said that a lot of Chinese environmental laws just don't really have uh, workable implementing mechanisms. It's just not in there. Um, so that's another question we ask as we look at uh, Chinese laws. Um, are the roles and relationships defined? And this gets to the, the question that, that often comes up in this room about uh, local protectionism. Uh, are there tools in the law for MEP to get a handle on what's going on in the environmental protection bureaus around the country uh, at, this, at the state and local level? Um, public participation, um, th you know, examples like having a requirement for uh, public hearings for environmental impact assessments, but then having a loophole that says, well, if you didn't do your hearing before you started the work, you can do it later, and there's no penalty. Um, <laughs> that's a <the> gap. <laughs> so that's, there's a gap. Um, and then uh, checks on the government, and, and this gets to, you know, are, are there provisions for judicial review? There's, there was the debate over whether to include a citizen suit provision in the water pollution control law amendments. Um, and this actually... I think touches on another gap that, that we're not even getting into today, but it's really sort of a gap for the, for the not just the environmental law people, but the China experts is the, the gap, the differences between the Chinese system and the U.S. system. And I think Dan might touch on this some, um, but the systems are so different. And so are our expectations as American lawyers looking at Chinese laws, are these expectations even realistic? Or, or another way to look at it is, um, as the leadership in China has embraced the rule of law at the rhetorical level, um, but how much progress is really being made towards that? If you don't have that, if you don't have independent judges and so forth, um, then all this talk of laws and enforcement and uh, th that kind of approach, regu the regulatory approach, um, really isn't in an environment where it can work until you have that larger system. So, you know, it's a gap, or another way to look at it is sort of maybe there's parallel evolution going on in the, in the, at the systemic level, rule of law, and also at the uh, more specific environmental level. Um, we hope anyway, but that's, that's a big question. Um, so, well, here's a picture of a great big gap. So this is just uh, uh, Jennifer's metaphor again. Um, there's all these very fancy buildings. You could sort of analogize them to the, to the very nice um, laws on the books, nice-looking laws on the books, but there's this big gap there in the middle. And you also see around the edges, there's all these cranes. They're apparently still working on a lot of the buildings. Um, so I like that as a metaphor for the, for the gaps, both in the laws and in the implementation of the laws. 
Um, so there's ongoing uh, construction. And I, I should also mention, you know, the gaps aren't just in the laws. There's also, you know, issues of capacity, issues of resources, funding. Um, you know, so it's not unique to the, the legal piece of the, of the environmental policy equation. Uh, China's ambitious legislative agenda, um, open government information law last year, I think an interesting question uh, there is, uh, I think as, as Tad alluded to, are the uh, confidential business information and state secret doctrines constraining uh, disclosure of information. And it's, as I understand it, um, there's a lot of flexibility for different jurisdictions to handle it differently. Um, but that's something definitely to watch. I think one good sign on that was that uh, MEP's predecessor, SEPA, was the first agency, I think, to come out with their regulations. Same, day, uh, same day as the, a broader Freedom of Information Act. So that's, that seems like a positive sign. The water pollution control law, um, Stronger enforcement provisions. Uh, Professor Professor Lee has written uh, eloquently in the recent uh, uh, recently for the China Environment Forum uh, about the uh, 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 sort of nascent public uh, interest litigation possibility that's that's in there. They didn't it didn't quite go as far as the citizen suit provision that some had hoped for, but there maybe is this kind of this provision that's sort of a nascent. Uh, public interest uh, uh, challenge provision, may, perhaps, um, and uh, also uh, in the in this round of amendments, stronger uh, legal basis for a permitting system and direction to uh, issue regulations to define that permitting system. Uh, we're very uh, anxious to see. Uh, the draft permitting regs, uh, they're in Chinese. If anyone has them in English, uh, we'd love it if they could share them with us. Um, but I think Careful. those... <laughs> Careful. <laughs> those regs could be very important in how they define what the permitting system looks like. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and then uh, chemicals and soil pollution and contaminated sites, these are areas where... Uh, the, where MEP has uh, specifically asked us to help them understand how our laws work so that you know, they may you know, not use any of it, but some, some of the aspects of it might be useful for them to think about um, as they uh, consider further legislation in this area. Um, and then the, uh, did I, oh, I skipped the air pollution control law because I'm gonna get to that in a minute. Um, but uh, I've got 2010 there. Who, who really knows? But uh, maybe, uh, maybe in 2010 they'll have some amendments there. We don't really know that. Um, I'll get to that a little more in a minute. Uh, I just wanted to also mention it's not just legal changes uh, and changes in the sort of the laws and the books. It's also institutional changes. And Tad mentioned some of these, the elevation to ministry status, uh, the development of the regional offices. This could be very important. Uh, for MEP to uh, get a handle on what's going on in the EPBs. Um, we don't know uh, whether they really have, whether these offices, what kind of legal authority do they have, what kind of role do they have vis-a-vis -vis the uh, provinces. Um, is it going to be an oversight role uh, comparable to sort of the, the, the EPA role? Uh, we, we, we don't know, but uh, it, it is an interesting uh, development and could be a very positive one. Um, and then increased attention to access to information, the role of the public, implementation mechanisms, uh, and compliance and enforcement, all, I think, uh, I think positive trends. Um, and let's see. Ah, so when we talk about the... Um, issue of, uh, well, how would one strengthen the air pollution control law in China? Um, you know, one way to talk about it is in terms of some of the lessons that we've learned in the U.S. system and that may be of relevance to China as they consider uh, whether to amend that law. And uh, so here, you know, a couple of trends uh, both in the U.S. and in other countries uh, towards the multi-pollutant approach and towards long-term planning and what my, my colleagues in the air office uh, at EPA 
have uh, been discussing these with China for a while now, and uh, you know part of the notion here is simply uh, more bang for the buck. If you're if you're thinking about not just one pollutant at a time, but but a whole bunch, and if you're planning it out for a long time, then you might you might think, well, you know, I might be have a target of ten percent, you know, in the next year or two, but I also need to think about is is the long term target going to be fifty percent reduction uh, going out. F- further, and, and you might make different investments in pollution control if you have that kind of long-term view in mind. And similarly, if you're looking at more than one pollutant, maybe different types of equipment, so you need to leave room for the different controls. Um, and maybe you can even, uh, well, so there may be efficiencies in thinking both long-term and multi-pollutant. Um, and then the, the, you know, how strong is the permitting system? going to be? Um, how strong are the provisions going to be if you amend the law? Are you going to set forth you know, some level of definition of what the permitting system would include? We'll get into that some more in a minute. And also this issue of uh, clear roles. And part of this is the roles of the provinces, uh, the roles of MEP, and, and the roles of uh, the public. Um, So to, to go back to the U.S. example, you know, we have, um, we have a fair amount of definition. Obviously, it's not all in the law. It's not all in the Clean Air Act. Um, and, of course, you don't necessarily need to have an 800-page law. That wouldn't necessarily be my recommendation. Some of it can be done in, in regulations and directives down the road. Um, but I think what is useful to think about is there is a fair amount of definition of uh, both the permitting process and the roles in that process for the feds, the states, and the public. So one issue might be, uh, would the public have the right to object to, to, uh, to, well, let me back up. Would the public have the right to see what a permit looks like before it's issued, and perhaps a role in that process? Um, would a downwind state have the ability, and would the downwind state have a role under the law in uh, in what the permit ends up allowing. Um, this is something that uh, is also plays out in the Clean Water Act in the water context, where uh, and this is always this always kind of surprises people in 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 China when we talk about this. But a, a downstream state um, has a role under the Clean Water Act with respect to a permit upstream, um, and they can they can put some they can sort of put some uh, obstacles in the way of having a permit go through that would allow too much pollution that would degrade the water quality downstream. There's, there's it's similar but a little bit, uh, a little bit different under the Clean Air Act. Um, and so this is another question: the, the sort of the cross boundary uh, pollution issue is one that China's been very concerned about. So we're um, explaining how we deal with that and uh, trying to get them thinking about those kinds of approaches is one. Uh, and of course, you know the U.S. approach is one model. Um, there are other models out there, and ultimately, China is going to do something with uniquely Chinese characteristics. So this is really all just kind of food for thought, rather than you know prescription. Do it this way. Um, and then, of course, the federal uh, role vis-a-vis the states. And uh, here, you know, in the U.S., the federal rule set the floor, authorizing. We, we authorize though the states to implement. Uh, the programs in most cases under our environmental laws. And um, while we authorize the states to, for example, write the permits, the federal government still plays a very uh, strong role, both in uh, regularly reviewing the programs in the states, also sometimes reviewing the actual individual permits, and sometimes even objecting if a permit uh, is not going to uh, uh, comply with the uh, with the law, um, and also uh, have the ability to independently enforce if the state isn't enforcing. Um, so these are all kinds of you can turn these into questions for China. Are you considering um, including these features in in your law? Do you already have them, or are you considering including them? Um, we went to uh, Jiang, uh, Jiangsu last year, and uh, you were warmly welcomed. We were very warmly welcomed, but also it was interesting to see that MEP 
and is working with the provinces with us. So they see this as a collaboration with the provinces. Um, and I should mention also on our side, it's a team effort, uh, including EPA's enforcement office, uh, which is well represented here and which actually coordinates the, uh, the overall work on environmental law and governance between EPA and, uh, and MEP. Um, and also some of our regional offices are involved as well. Um, and that's also important because I think through them, our states, some of our states will be involved in this as well. So the provinces will have sort of the natural counterparts. Um, so in that context, enforcement law and uh, regional, there's um, a set of projects that are linked. They cover not just law, but also environmental impact assessment, enforceable requirements, uh, development of the regional offices in MEP, uh, the enforcement system, uh, and then, so that's sort of looking at, one way to look at this is concentric circles, right? There's the law and uh, enforcement group, and then you go out further, and there's also air and water and waste and toxics, and we're working with those offices in EPA on this as well. This is not in isolation. Uh, but then you have another concentric circle further out from that, of we're also uh, trying to make uh, as effective uh, use as we can of, of possibilities for partnering with other groups, Asian Development Bank, World Bank, American Bar Association, NRDC, all these groups that are doing work in, in China, and there's a whole bunch more that I haven't mentioned. Um, so let's see. Uh, we got to see some of their nifty uh, hardware. You can see sort of the, uh, on the sides there, uh, the real-time monitoring. Uh, of the uh, of the treatment plant, um, so this is our our MEP and EPA team uh, all together while we were there. And uh, let's see. Oh, this is and then Jennifer mentioned our website, uh, which uh, has information on Chinese in environmental law, uh, put up by EPA's Office of General Counsel. Um, it's at www.epa.gov/slash OGC, and um, there's summaries of there's summaries of some of our activities with MEP on there, but I, that's not the good stuff. The good stuff is we, we try to keep up with news from China that bears on environmental law in China, um, but also we try to either post or link to reports and articles that come out on China. So Dan Dan's article is up there. I think there's a link to one of Tad's uh, many 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 articles. Um, and uh, also, you know, the, the OECD report, the uh, ADB stuff, there's stuff from the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Liz Economy, um, American Chamber of Commerce, NGOs. So there, that's sort of, to me, that's sort of the good stuff that's on there. Um, the, so anyway, to go back to the metaphor, the legal framework is under construction. Um, it's broad, but it's still evolving. Uh, we talked some about gaps in the laws and implementation but also in resources and also in the legal system itself. Um, and we're hoping to achieve uh, this, harmonious, uh, this harmonious state eventually. Okay. I was like when people, I, I haven't had anyone in a tongue like that before. It's good. All right. Applaud for the gentleman, please. Dan. Uh, thank you. Uh, like. Uh, Steve, I first was introduced to China environmental law through uh, Jennifer's uh, gathering such as this before I went to China as a Fulbright. For obvious reasons, it's an honor to be here. Uh, people whose work I use and have uh, relied on for years, Jeremy Schreifel, but this morning looking at the classic Oxenberg and Lieberthal study of uh, energy <laughs> bureaucracy. Uh, Tad, we were talking in Beijing a couple of months ago about how many Americans who purport to do environmental law actually are fluent in Chinese. And we came up, when you add the billable hours, to about two and a half Americans, and I think Tad's about one of those. <laughs> uh, when I speak in China, first of all, I'm a Bushi Zhong Guotong. I'm not a China hand, and I'm not an environmental hand. When I speak in China, I say I'm not an environmental expert, but some of my best friends are in China. That gets a lot of applause. People think I'm modest and have Guanxi connections. <laughs> but you do. Right. And here you're saying, what the hell do you have them speaking, right? Uh, Captive audience, they'll come. Right. They like our scones. I 
first went to China, uh, John McCain sent me uh, in 1998 the International Republic Institute, and I ended up in Haikou, Hainan Island. I thought I'd take a bus to Shanghai, then I looked at the map. <laughs> But what surprised me, other than that it was Christmas and everybody was wearing Santa Claus stocking caps and it was 95 degrees and there weren't many Christians, uh, <laughs> what surprised me through the uh, translators, because I didn't even say ni hao properly, still don't, uh, was that uh, everybody was using the language we use here in Washington or London or Berlin, the, the global vernacular of governance, words like rule of law, uh, public participation, uh, NGO, civil society. And I said, I don't understand it. And what was amazing to me, because of course the participants, uh, this was uh, CI the, the think tank, uh, you know, in the CIRD, most people were party members, were people arguing about the rule of law, saying, you don't believe in it and I do. And I'm saying, well, gee, I didn't know anybody believed in it. Now there are many versions of it. And it became evident we're in a world where there's a global vernacular of governance. Uh, you can be anywhere, and as my colleague Shanghai Zhao Da said, bad English is the new global language. <laughs> Maybe in uh, 50 years it'll be uh, bad Chinese. <laughs> and uh, to, to take a turn on Mike Lampton's book, it's not uh, same bed, different dreams. It's same dream, different meanings. And when I went to China, therefore, I was privileged to spend a year at uh, Tsinghua Gonggong Guanli as part of an environmental comparative governance study with Chi Ye. And I thought I would follow up on our wonderful friend, colleague, Derwood Zelke's title for his two-volume compendium, Making Law Work. So my, being neither a China hand nor environmental hand, my question was, how do you translate between the systems? Same words, different meanings. And what I found, uh, very interestingly, and I've had this discussion with Cheryl, so this is an argument rather than the truth, right, uh, is that uh, the title, Making Law Work, is not the apt title for China. If I were going to title that book today, I would be something like making requirements or rules, not law, because in the envir environmental area and perhaps other public law areas, what's key is the plan, not the law. Um, the gap that we're talking about, illustrations of the gap. As uh, Tad was saying, uh, there's a lot of law writing and law drafting in China. There are a lot of laws in China, but implementation is a different question. The law schools in China, like my alma mater, Yale Law School, when I was there, they like writing laws and thinking a lot less empirical research. The public policy schools, government, where China really works, uh, at the Gong Gong Guanli at Tsinghua, one of my colleagues said, you know, Dan, this is a colleague, many of you know, he's got a PhD from an eminent American university, so he understands America. He said, we like to teach law at the Gong Gong Guanli, the public policy school, but Shema Falu, what is law? You guys, as far as we understand it, there are two things in the law. One is the spirit of the law, justice, fairness, reasonableness, blah, 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 as my students say. And the other is codes, legislation, Li Fog, Wei Tse. But China, we already we have two, three thousand years of tradition about fairness and justice. This is what the government is about. This is what we teach. And these codes, we have many of them, but they don't work. So what are you teaching us? So there's a real ability to repeat by rote without comprehension. Where the rubber hits the road, we go to, as uh, Tad, we all know and love Bia Tao. But how many other lawyers are there in the MEP? At the local level, Steve showed the picture of Pudong, the signature in China's uh, Shanghai uh, signature. My colleague at the Pudong EPB says, well, you know, we don't have any lawyers on our staff. So when we're talking about law, how do you have law without lawyers? Uh, Steve showed the... Uh, <laughs> Steve, Steve. Oh. <laughs> well, that's probably easier, probably be fairer and better, but I don't want to get into that because I'm a paid member of the profession. Uh, but Steve uh, pointed out as an example of the uh, CIS transplant, I know EPA, th this regional office uh, transplant, a wonderful presentation by Wang San Fa uh, half a year ago, I think Steve was there, the regional office structure in China uh, has no legal basis. Yeah. Uh, so if we're transplanting a quintessential legal contact, uh, organizational structure, that legal basis, and moreover, there are no government officials who staff it. So into this uh, question, what is law, how does it work, what I tried to do would listen to what my colleagues told me. And um, the overview is that we have uh, two common values in America and China, and that this is, of course, what I say, and you all have better expertise and perspective, but we are both uh, systems that believe in pragmatism and stability. It's not about so much a communism or democracy looking at in the bureaucratic context. Pragmatism, we understand, we created it. Uh, Hu Xia took it from uh, John Dewey into uh, Beijing in 1910, 11, 12. 
And of course, Deng Xiaoping, a black cat, white cat. So we're very comfortable with the notion of stability. Like no, thank you. Notion of stability. Of, of, of practice. Stability is a little bit more difficult because the question a, a, a non-China hand would have is, well, why is China so concerned about stability? Big country, long history, and of course, when you're there, you know stability is uh, Zhongyao, very important. When you think about it, we also have a, a tradition of stability. If you go to Federalist 10, Madison, you know, the father of the Constitution, said stability is the key in creating a government, but our operating system, stability is about factions, non-governmental entities. And our solution to the stability problem is multiplication of factions. Uh, China, that's in some ways anathema. It's central you know, authority. So to begin to translate our system, which is very comfortable with non-governmental factions, it goes hand in glove with the common law tradition, law from the bottom, 600 years. Environmental law, uh, Steve and Tad, can t uh, it's about nuisance. It's about how a concept 500, 600 years old gets brought into the uh, modern system. If we didn't have laws, and before we had 1970s environmental legislation, and today lawyers can bring nuisance lawsuits, don't need top-down statutes. We're comfortable from the bottom. China is you know, top down, uh, start with Han Feja, legalism, civil law, and socialist planning. So when I got into the system and I tried to listen, people, when you'd ask what you're doing, you say, it's, it's the plan. So we think about what's the biggest global issue, climate change, right? What's the single most important climate change measure being taken by China? And it's not climate change as such, is the, the point of entry, the Chia Rudian, is energy efficiency, energy security. It's the five-year plan, the Jianung, the energy efficiency requirement. It's not in a law. It's in um, the plan. So what do I mean by plan? And I, it's a little bit uh, humbling to be here with uh, Ken Lieberthal because, you know, <laughs> but, uh, and I, I just looked this morning at, your, at the 2003 edition, which I'm teaching. I think you say the plans were fading out, yet economic plans, and I'm sort of arguing to the contrary. Uh, what's happened is that... Okay. Uh, so the okay. Okay. Um, many plans in China. There are plans at all levels. The top plan, of course, is the Beijing five-year plan. Uh, many topics. Plans, of course, can be hortatory. We should do better. But what I'm talking about, the plan, I'm talking about something that, from an American lawyer or a legal anthropologist, looks a lot like law, uh, meaning something by which the a government states, we will do this, then effectuates it by a set of what I, as an American lawyer, would call agreements. In the Chinese context, it's the target, Mubiao, and the, as an American lawyer, and this is a very loose, I would call it a contract or an agreement, Jaren Zhuang, Jaren Chu, between, levels of, between and among levels of government, with uh, incentives and penalties tied into the appointment uh, process or the promotional process. And so, as an American lawyer, I would say this is a set of rules. It's a set of government rules, uh, more or less transparent in certain degrees, with penalties or, uh, re you know, rewards. Whether or not it works is a separate question, but the structure, the form, is the form of what an American lawyer would call uh, law. At the central level, the five-year plan, there are now three primary energy or environmental requirements. The energy efficiency, which is the close to the uh, climate change. In the environmental area, it's the sulfur dioxide and the C uh, COD, com uh, combined oxygen. Um, but every level of government has plans. So we go to Nanjing, we talk to the local officials, probably the key adder for their environment is restaurants. Uh, you find out, uh, Wang San Fa teaches us, the biggest environmental problem in China, according to many people, is restaurant noise, restaurant smoke. Beijing is not going to be setting rules for restaurants. So you go to the local level and you find every kind of requirement. So uh, you find things about uh, we've got to make uh, 10 wastewater treatment plants or 100 percent compliance with this. Or my favorite was we should have like three meetings of the, uh, you know, this, this year, right? It can be anything. It's a grab bag. Some of these are public. Uh, Shaman and Dalian put them on the web. In Beijing, you go talk to people. They say, we can tell you our clean air day requirement, but the rest of it is a secret, right? Um, so they look like American law. 
They have uh, point systems so that the uh, EPB head in a local area will get 10 points for having uh, three meetings a week or 12 points for cleaning up this. It, you know, it's a point system. So what is the relationship between plan and law? And here are some very interesting comparative questions. First, are plans law? And this is what I think. Obviously, we discussed these. You guys can tell me I'm wrong. My reading as a non-China hand, non-environmental expert, is that plans are legal. They are legal in the sense that the Constitution of China provides for plans and that statutes provide for plans and that the state council or the local, uh, you know, renda, you know, authorize plans. They are legal. But they are not law. What do I mean by they are not law? Well, the li fa fa, the law on laws, which provides for reconciliation, conflicts of laws, does not define a plan to be a law. So um, they are legal uh, but not law. I note that some of my Chinese colleagues who study American law uh, and many American lawyers would say they can't be law because they are not enforceable by the outside, by third parties. A lot of Chinese uh, mistakenly overenthusiastic about our system from my perspective as a practicing lawyer believe that whenever the government violates the law, somebody outside the government can enforce it. In fact, that's quite a historical. In America, we have something called sovereign immunity from the common law tradition, which has to be waived, and we have the modern doctrine of standing. Until the 1946-47 Administrative Procedure Act, you couldn't just do notice and comment. Today, representing workers or whistleblowers, it's very hard to get into court on many occasions, because even if the government violates the law, you can't do anything. So that there is no third-party enforcement in my uh, structural functional perspective doesn't make it not law by an American context. Plan and law, conflict or consistent. Here there is a tremendous gap in research. It's a profound failure uh, not only on the Chinese side but the Western side and I'm probably wrong, you'll correct me, but looking back other th since your 1988 book on the energy and environment there has been a kind of uh, evacuation of the territory of the study of Chinese bureaucracy. Uh, people now studying you know, business uh, they study uh, piracy, IP, uh, they study internet, but no bureaucratic structural, it's, it's a total void. And I, I say this to get people to tell me I'm wrong and tell me where the examples. Uh, the, uh, probably an, ex an exception that proves the rule is the terrific book by Benjamin von, von Reusch uh, from uh, Leiden last year, two years ago. It's a case study of Kunming uh, environmental activities. He uh, talks about the law and he talks about campaigns, but there's nothing there. The hole in the donut is the, the role of the plan. So um, one is there's a gap here. And two is that there are very few lawyers in China environmental agencies. So there's nobody sitting there as there are in our EPA saying, you can't do this, this is at odds with the laws. So there's, and there's no, the, the li fa fa doesn't provide for reconciliation. So one is we don't know. Two, uh, you've got certain ki three kinds of cases. One, as in the climate change, Jianong energy efficiency, you've got plans where there is no law. Um, two, I think there is really clearly a resource allocating function that the plans de facto fulfill. So, for example, if you've got the number one thing that Wen Jiabao is concerned with is the energy efficiency requirement, and that's tied to your promotion, you're going to do that, then follow a law. Or alternatively, if there are some laws that are addressed in a target and others are not, you're going to you know, follow the, the plan. Uh, a second uh, part of it that's very interesting is, I think, maybe third part, the plans seem to me to be tied to monetary resources. Uh, you guys from EPA know better than I do the role of federal incentives, right, in getting localities to act. Unfunded mandate, of course, we all know about in the U.S., and my colleagues in China who are the experts on the financing say this is a problem, more laws than bucks. My understanding, and this is a hypothesis, is that in the planning system, that is a resource allocation. So when that the Pudong uh, environmental EPB is tasked by the mayor to set the targets, they go to the other agencies in Pudong, the infrastructure agency, the IT agency, they draw up a list of things, and they say this is going to require X billion RMB. And then they go to mayor. And so they get resources. You don't have that, as far as I can tell, with laws. So that there is a positive resource incentive. In addition, also, there is the promotional uh, incentive. And there is in a, a number of the actual um, uh, 
uh, local Mubiao targets I've seen, the local EPB will get resources in exchange for uh, performing. So in, in the American sense, there's consideration for this contract. So um, basic question is, what's the relation between plan and law? My Chinese colleagues say, Dan, fit together like a hand and glove. Laws are abstract, hardly ever changed. Nobody pays much attention. Plans tell you what to do. Well, this is, you know, I guess I read that as saying, well, you could put anything into a plan and it wouldn't be inconsistent. But what you get is the law says the air should be clean. Uh, the plan says 180 days. Now, in some ways, this is not dissimilar from our system, and you got, you're the expert, Steve, where the clean air law says the air should be clean, but Los Angeles says we can't do it now. How about another five years? <laughs> it's sort of, a, you know, you've got a negotiated process. Two or three very interesting further questions uh, when you compare the Chinese planning system to the American system. One is this uh, key question of GDP versus environment. This is something that I didn't appreciate. It's quite counterintuitive. We are, um, um, I had been under the assumption that GDP trumps all. We all know this. This is what China is about, GDP. Well, let's compare the American system and the China system. Take the Clean Air Act. We are a law-centric system. Congress passes the Clean Air Act, and it's a health-based standard, right? Mm -hmm. The ambient standard. Yeah, well, it, it not, and you don't take into account GDP, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, EPA writes the enabling regs. Uh, industry says this is an outrage. You didn't do cost benefit. You didn't do this. The court under Chevron says, hey, you got to change the law. In our system, once this GDP balance is made in the statute and interpreted by EPA, it sticks. If you don't like it under Chevron, you got to change the law. But in China, because of the Tiao Kwai, the vertical horizontal, and the role of the plan, what you've got is, so there is a law that the China MEP must, you know, it's got a law. But then you've got the target for SO2 or COD in the plan. That comes through the center. It comes from the Fog Ai Wei, the Endar National Development Reform Commission. It doesn't come from the MEP or it comes from the party indirectly. Same thing, it flows down to the governor, to the mayor, so that you've got a law which is out there, but the operative uh, requirement doesn't come. The balance between GDP and environment is not made in the law, it's made in the plan. And it's a double effect. One is, in contrast to our, quote, law-centric system, the decider of the balance is not the, con it's the uh, center of the government. It's the Fog Ai Wei, the, the governor, the mayor. The other thing that's interesting is when people say that there is a, a GDP trumping the plan requirement, the interesting thing is that the people who are ultimately responsible, the central actors, the NDRC, the governor, the mayor, they are responsible for making that balance. They are signing off on both. So intuitively, if the plan says you should have this environmental requirement, the people who made that requirement have already considered and are primarily responsible for the GDP. So it's not, you know, in other words, that, that balancing should be made at the center, and so there's a question of why it isn't effectuated. Um, where, uh, um, another, two other questions that come up that are very interesting is, uh, there was a workshop in Tsinghua uh, last month, and one of the things that became apparent is that there is a governing assumption that you can't have horizontal enforcement in China, no quai level enforcement. If you're going to enforce environmental requirements, it's top down, so that the local EPB cannot, whatever the law says, it's up to the mayor or it's up to the commerce, you know, it depends on who's got the clout. And I was thinking about that because in our country, we assume, of course, there can be horizontal enforcement with some caveats. So at the federal level, uh, we've got the Federal Facilities Act, and the caveat being we didn't get it till the end of the Cold War when we thought it was okay and safe to do it, right? <laughs> But you've got horizontal enforcement. In Chicago today, we see that the, the Chicago legislature is taking action against the chief executive for you know, other reasons, right? And so a part of the question I have is, is it arguable that uh, there is a relationship between the perceived absence of quiet level enforcement and the kind of secondary role of law? We have a law that you know, permits, har law gives authority to bureaucratic actors to provide for horizontal enforcement that you don't get in a plan-based system. A third question that's quite interesting is, this is all nebu. Uh, Biatau uh, said, uh, and I'm sure, inside, inside government. 
and, and that most that a, a core contrast between China and the U.S. Of course, we had started our environmental law system with the notion that the big polluters are private entities, non-governmental entities. In China, of course, it's you know start off as state-owned enterprises. So another core difference is the China government must enforce against sort of itself. This changes, but it's still the rule. And in that sense, um, the plan as the core law requirement makes sense because you're trying to get the government to work. A question I have is what happens as pollution problems spill out so that the, the, the polluters are not governmental entities? So today you've got the Jianung, the energy efficiency is targeting 1,000 or 1,008 large, uh, efficient, large users. And so a question I've had, well, how many of them are not state-owned enterprises. So what happens if I'm not a state enterprise and the mayor or the governor says, you've got to agree to this uh, contract? And I say, hey, where are you coming from? There's no law. This wasn't put into effect according to a law. I don't know the answer to the question. Uh, some of my colleagues say, well, this is China. If the government says you do it, you do it. It doesn't matter whether you're a state-owned enterprise or not. And other colleagues say, no, this is a real practical question because there is the ability increasingly of a marketized system to say if it's in the plan but not in the law, not done by the law, we have a question. So summary, where can we go through here, from here with the role of plan in mind? There are many, many interesting, useful comparisons. Uh, despite the difference, both our system, American system, the China system, really are also viewed as a network of top-down requirements that uh, you know, while it's uh, obvious that we are a federal system and China is a unitary system, as our Chinese colleagues say, we have a lot in common, both strong traditions of local control, difang baohu, right, a lot in common in fact. And so you've got the Clean Air Act is put into effect through state implementation plans, agreements, right? So you could compare and contrast the way that the plans are effectuated top down, the way the agreements work, study the baselines, how are the baselines derived, the monitoring, all these kinds of administrative questions lend themselves to comparison. Two, both our systems are resource, are government resource short. Uh, it's a truism that however big governments are, there are more uh, polluters than government. The comparison here is quite interesting on several counts. One is that our U.S. EPA, you guys know it, is it 17,000, 18,000 civil servants? 17,000. 17, okay, 17,000 civil servants. The China MEP, astonishing to me, is about 300, right? So a question you ask is, well, how can this be, right? Uh, and uh, both our systems rely on, uh, I wrote a book many years ago, Shadow Government. Uh, government contractors in the U.S. Uh, we don't know, EPA, no agency knows how many people it employs to do the basic work of government under contract. China has equivalent, the Xie Danwei, the professional workforce. So I gather the number of Xie Danwei Ren, a professional uh, workforce people, are about 2,000 roughly accompanying the MEP. At the local level in China, most of the inspection and monitoring for the environmental agencies, my understanding, it's all uh, Xie Danwei Ren. So the Pudong uh, monitoring and evaluation are about six civil servants and a hundred Xie Danwei. So this is a profound rule of law question. We have not resolved it. This is, if you want to put it in today's newspaper's term, it's Blackwater. It's the Blackwater Halliburton. What do you do with non-governmental actors that are in the midst of the legal decisional process? It's a, a question we have that's more or less front and center after climate change and economic crisis and health care. <laughs> Uh, and in the China system, it's not yet percolated because there's nobody testing it. Nobody asked these questions. But it's coming to test because, as uh, Steve and I know, we'd, at the regional office, you've got 30 workers, and they're all Xie Danwei. So when they go into the localities, they say, you know, they can't say we're the government. They may say it, but people say you're not the government, right? So this is a, this is a legal question, comparing and contrasting. Um, the, the other uh, final closing point is that what about the convergence, this question of what will be the relationship between law and plan? It's very interesting to me because one view is sort of the happy glide path view is these two things will converge. Uh, 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 Lani Zhang uh, pointed out to me the, current, the 19, 2008 Clean Water Law basically says uh, when you do the law, you've got to check the plan. You could write into the law a linkage. Um, but it's not clear because there just aren't lawyers in the system to check and ensure. A second thing that I think is interesting from my own context doing uh, 
working for uh, you know citizens and uh, workers in the United States is in essence uh, one can look at the plan and the requirements like you would look at laws and use American style information regulation with Chinese characteristics uh, the government has said this is a target the government has said that uh, this uh, city or this this uh, local agency has to do such and such so if I were a Chinese NGO I could say great collect all this data put it on the web uh, and using uh, two uh, very interesting forces one is China like the US is intensely competitive when you compare the operating systems our notions of competition are often about market private private competition In China you have never seen competition Everybody says, too many people. We've got to compete to survive. Shanghai competes with Beijing. Uh, you know, Chengdu competes with Shanghai and Beijing. And so this uh, competition among localities, brought home to me first by uh, Gene, Oil's, Gene Oil's work about TBEs and Susan Shirk's book about the development, the uh, opening, you know, city, city, or uh, lo locality competition, so that you could use the uh, planning data as a way of, you know, forcing people to begin to, you know, work towards the, the state requirements. The other thing, as Tad pointed out, is the new information laws. And uh, one of the things that's obvious in the law, they've got some big gaps, not big gaps, big exemptions, I think, like national security, stability, anything that can endanger the economy. And I'm thinking, that's pretty big. But uh, what you have with the plan requirements is that sporadically, a lot of these targets and data on the plans are put on the web. And so you've got some localities that say no problem. Others say this is a secret. But the fact that they've already been disclosed is in some ways this is a wonderful thing. So you can use this to begin to open up. Use the free information law not by just by spitting into the wind saying give me this information and everybody's saying gee I don't know it's never been released before. What are we going to do, right? But by using the, uh, the targets as kind of a basketball backboard uh, to uh, bounce off. Well this has already been done here. How come you guys aren't doing it? So uh, I apologize uh, for the length. And uh, uh, the, the conclusion is that it's really puzzling to me why this has received uh, this, this question of the continuing role of the plan has received, and I, I, I hear Cheryl say, this is, I don't mean to say the country is run or the environment is run by this, but the continuing role as what I hear from people who tell me this is how our system works, why it's subject to so little uh, inquiry and particular relationship to the law. Okay, we have about a half hour, so if I can ask, there are a lot of people with questions. If we can try to keep the questions and statements succinct, and I've got two interns. Uh, Alyssa's got one mic, and someone else has got another one. And you need to speak in the mic because we've got those nice people in Webland. So, Alyssa, could you come up here and we'll start? And if you could just real quick say, just say your name and, you know, EPA or whatever. Dan Merhoff, University of Maryland School of Law. Uh, Dan, I want to uh, question your, your parallel between uh, resources being short. Shiye uh, Danwei, most of them are not getting budgetary monies from the from the Chinese government. Sometimes they are, some of them are not. They usually get funding through squeezing those that they are regulating, that they've been entrusted to regulate. Contractors, on the other hand, are draining a lot of our resources, and there are good arguments for returning some of the outsourced uh, activities back to government to save money. So there's one problem in the parallel right there. Uh, I have a question for Tad as well, and this is something that's intriguing me. I am not an environmental law expert. I can consider myself 70% a China hand. Um, what about, uh, I've been reading on the web the idea that there's going to be collective payment, that they've, they've, they've frozen the milk scandal uh, litigation and said it's not going to go through litigation in Shijiazhuang, in Hebei. But rather, they're going to do it through sort of an administrative method and get everybody compensation. And what they've decided to do is that all the milk companies will somehow chip in that it's being collectively opposed on the milk industry. And I, su I assume the same thing can be done with respect to pollutants as well, that you know, cleaner entities, ones who are trying to comply, will end up having to pay for the non-compliers. And I wonder if you have a comment on that. I haven't been following the milk scandal that closely. Uh, I do know, however, that one of the interesting um, results of that uh, milk scandal was that uh, for – I'm just trying to find a – I do have – this is that the interestingly San Lu, which was behind this, was you know for a long time a very respected uh, company, very large company, took advantage of a uh, 
provision in our rule on exports that said if you have a good quality background, you can be um, you can receive uh, an exemption from export uh, inspections. Uh, that obviously that law was immediately repealed. That provision in that law, um, uh, and we're seeing now that there's much less flexibility in terms of getting that sort of we're a good apple. Um, uh, kind of uh, regulatory relief uh, for uh, for companies, enterprises uh, that are operating in China, and it's unfortunate because there's already that mentality that there. Is in, you know, I talk to a lot of regulator friends, and there is really, a, a, you know, you're if you're in the private sector, you're a bad apple. We have to be suspicious of you. People are scoffing those laws everywhere, not eating them, but disregarding them. And that tendency um, tends to move that, you know, the legal system to address the lowest common denominator. It's unfortunate. I mean, we do understand. We were in a digital video conference with the Environmental Protection um, Agency here in the U.S. and the Ministry of Environmental Protection. They were talking about the chemicals laws, and they were very curious. You know, it was great to have the dialogue because they're developing their new chemical registration system. But one of the questions came out to the U.S. EPA said, when you make a decision, are you ever worried that you're going to be personally liable if something goes wrong? And, and it reflected that sense that you do have within the agencies there. People can get into big trouble if something goes wrong with the s toxic spills that have occurred and still occur daily. <laughs> um, the safety issues, uh, I know the State Administration for Work Safety, they have helicopters ready to fly at a moment's notice. It doesn't matter what area of the work safety you're dealing with. If you're focused on the tobacco industry, it doesn't matter. If there's a mining accident, everybody gets in and goes out there. The officials are really sensitive on that area. And when you have that kind of environment, it becomes very difficult to innovate sometimes, and it's something that concerns me. Um, in terms of uh, compensation issues, I do see that. I mean, I can't, I don't have the latest on the, the tainted milk issues, but I do know in, in other areas, I see that focusing around, you know, folks that are trying to go to, there are enough challenges, but I'm hoping that we can look at other areas and also find uh, the means in China to take advantage of laws. I mean, in the chemicals law, indeed, it has, it has a provision that allows them to impose a three-year import and manufacture ban if you fail to register. But if you go anywhere in China to scan the web, you can find unregistered chemicals. It's often daunting to a lot of the folks we work with, you know, who who takes so much time to go through a very arduous review process and everything that there is that. And the officials are aware of it. And, and that's something that, you know, hopefully we'll see a sea change about soon. Okay, and just real quick. Yeah, yeah one first, we're friends. It's a friend. On the Xi'ai Donway, it's an empirical question. I think you were saying that the Xi'ai Donway take money from the, the polluters. The, the fund, they're funded by the, the, the regulated, regulated entities. The empirical question is, A, is that any different than the officials in many towns who also may be funded by the entities? <laughs> B is that my understanding, having tried to get into this question, is that at the MEP, Xie Dunway do go out, are marketized after Zhu Ranji's reforms to downsize, you guys get your own money, but the local levels, for example, Shanghai, Pudong, in fact, it's 100% government funded. It's an empirical question getting at the conflict of interest. A question for Ted on the milk is, are there, as far as I can tell, there are no uh, permitted group actions, and that what we're seeing is the Chinese characteristics is that the solution for these, uh, you call toxic torts, uh, are going to be... Uh, or I'm not sure they're all toxic, are going to be uh, government solutions the way that after 911, Ken Feinberg was given the role of uh, you fix this, we're not going to have a court. You know, whether we're really seeing, notwithstanding all the talk, any group actions that are succeeding on either the milk or the school, uh, succeeding I, in being accepted, not succeeding in being won. I, I mean, that we should know very soon. I yeah. mean, a lot of that activity that I, I've been talking about that's evident in the press, it, it, it's just a... It's, it's something that the government was really caught by surprise about. I mean, a lot of the, the toxic torts that we usually see, the, the, the ones that resulted in um, Xi Jinping others stepping down, yeah. um, a lot of that was government intervening. I mean, the efforts of our, of our friends in the, you know, in the legal area, I'm, I'm pulling out this, I haven't read through it yet, uh, I have the Chinese and English, but it's a, a case study on 
uh, tort case for 1,721 victims of pollution. So um, I'll make sure Jennifer gets that for people that want to. <laughs> is this uh, CLAP? Is this Wong San Fa's group? Or is it, it's related to Wong San yeah. Fa's group. Yeah. But it's actually um, the main actors behind it was the Green Association of Ping Nan. Yeah, the so, Ping Nan guys. We uh, had a box on them in, in our yeah, pub a box on two them. years ago. So, okay, um, Cheryl. Hi. Um, I almost lost my train of thought. Um, in, in response to some of the points you were making, I, and and the excellent comments from all my colleagues that, um, yes, you have to, some things get lost in translation. As my, as I've learned from my colleague, Professor Jing Jian Yu Li, administrative penalties in China is removing an official from his position and he loses his job, which is a completely different concept than administrative penalties in the United States. And everything is very personal, and everything is very uh, the responsibility of these appointed officials in their in their job. And they'll be moved out. Sometimes they'll be moved in an equally nice position elsewhere, but that's the sanction. But I do see, and I, I'm 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 making a statement, and I'd like it you to comment on it. From what I've I've seen, um, environmental protection initially was a creature of economic policy. The way you met these reduction targets, and I agree, the plans have been very important and so forth, was that you shut down marginal operations that you needed to shut down because they were economically marginal and you want to create more uh, pro greater productivity and build newer plants that are less polluting. And so that you had not only permission but directive from on high. And that the re enforcement, uh, in a long-term sense, of actually um, having facilities operate, but operate in compliance with some requirements, has been more elusive. It's not the focus. But I see a couple of trends. One of them, and this goes against the grain of everybody's equal and everybody shares in this, is the adoption of higher penalties. In fact, the targets for environmental targets were not met to the chagrin of the prime minister. And I think that they'll find that the system doesn't work for them like it does in other areas. And um, so, and they've also lacked the infrastructure to implement our laws. I don't think we could have made the progress we did on our Water Act if we just had the act and regulations. We had permits which translated that into a, into a requirement at the individual facility level. And I think it, the, the adoption of the permitting program in water will make, potentially make a huge difference along with these additional penalties uh, for, for engaging law in a more integrated way. Um, and I think it's also happening um, as it does in the United States with some leaders you have a number of provincial governments that have really taken the bigger step, not the minimum, of SO2 and COD and the reduction, uh, the percent reductions, but actually going after some of their stuff. Um, you look, in the United States, we have 60-year-old power plants that are not controlled. I mean, we have our issues, too. And they are working against the clock in China, given the enormous growth and potential. But at least I see that they're working on some of these instruments as, as well as better ways to hold provincial governments accountable mm -hmm. that go beyond just this accounting and levy system of, um, you know, the inventories and levies. They are working with us on that. So I see adoption of some of these other regulatory tools and approaches that will start to put in place the apparatus you need to make these things real. Okay. I just want to comment, Any, you to comment on comment that. response from anybody up here? Well, a part, I know that, you, of course, OECA and also I think Dan Dudek from Vet Environment Defense have made this low-level penalty. How can you have enforcement if you don't get punished? I'm afraid, I think, I don't, we don't know enough. I think this is really a cultural question. I was surprised when I read our colleague Derwood's compendium that the literature on enforcement, the, on, we're talking about globally, is, is the Becker article is very small 
understanding, some little theory about the relationship between penalty and compliance. I was in the Clinton administration a commissioner of the OSHA Review Commission, and I was really surprised. I got my first case, big case. The penalty was $250. Under OSHA. I mean, but we have more or less pretty good compliance with OSHA. So how much is that cultural? The other side of it, we know, is uh, China, you can get the death penalty, right? So you yeah. kill the chicken to, you know, scare, scare, the, to, monkeys. scare the monkeys, right? right. So I, I, I think that there's got to be a finer grain thinking about the relationship between the, you know, just the, the level of the penalty and what you're going to get. And as we all know, and you, you're saying, and I think I was looking at uh, Ken Lieberthal's Chapter 7 of the 1980 book, each, you know, it's different region, <laughs> re the central local relations, provinces are different. Some are rich, some are poor, some have the incentive to attract Western industry, Shanghai, some just want to get industry, right? So I, I don't know that there's, uh, it may be too uh, much of a, a sludge. I'm putting more attention on permitting versus the Okay, yeah. well, Steve, yeah. Steve, Steve. Uh, I think those are all good, excellent points. I, I wanna uh, Steve, make sure you're talking to the mic, Oops, sorry. sorry. We yeah, like the folks in Webland. Great points, um, and I uh, wonder how it's perceived in the in the from the perspective of uh, private uh, uh, companies doing business in China. And he looks at Ted. I mean, indeed, <laughs> they're looking. You see this sort of nascent role. The environmental impact assessment statement that you get often served as a. You know, you often hear people say, well, I never looked at that. It was not translated. Oh, my God, that's what you're supposed to live by, mm -hmm. you know, because that will cover pretty much everything and more that you might not have seen if the, if the consulting company, which are now under great scrutiny by the government mm -hmm. for not just throwing those things together, didn't put a, together the right level of detail or the put something in that you couldn't do. Indeed, my one of the most interesting ones I worked on a long time ago um, related to a jet engine testing facility, and there, the, the, the impact st statement wasn't looked at, and it imposed all of these controls on the testing facility. Well, if you're going to test a jet engine, you know, you, you can't be limited that much. You've got to take it up to its extremes, and no one ever considered that. And so the environmental impact statement actually didn't allow the uh, facility to operate uh, if it was implemented appropriately. But looking at that, they are looking at that. They're looking at the multimedia permit vehicle because that is something that they will then look to as the record, as the vehicle by which then they will uh, identify whether this entity is in compliance. The other thing is that I've talked to a lot of the officials that are drafting. They're looking at the penalty provisions. We always hope for something a little more uh, if not uh, stringent, you know, clear, but also some innovation, as I said. Um, you do see that. You see now more and more um, provisions that aren't quite to the level of whistleblowing, but they do, they are promoting that. It's a standard in every law to say we encourage you to, you know, shout out if you see some violating activity. But, of course, what are the protections for that individual? That's a different that's a different situation. But the, trans, the transparency initiatives are going to start to change uh, that culture, as well as the media's role. Um, we've often talked in this forum about how the media, I've been on uh, with media, the journalists that go in after the government leaves, because when the government comes, often everyone knows, and they turn back on the scrubbers, and they do everything. But then they leave, and the media sits around and sees what's happened, and watches them shut everything off again, or undertake other. Uh, legal activities, and that is often a, uh, uh, something that um, uh, it also has an effect on compliance. I talked about that sense, though, that you know, er, uh, the officials are very, very concerned about uh, flexibility in some of the rules, but also I'm hoping for a little more in terms of testing some of their rules. It takes a lot of effort, but for example, that the provision I said about you know, a three-year import ban, if they use that once against an entity that was really egregiously uh, violating the law, rejecting the law, that kind of thing, that would send a pretty good message around. They are very good at promoting that kind of understanding, and they are thinking about these. The other, the other issue is the moral suasion aspects. There is an increasing number of blacklists. There are an increasing number of, uh, of related... Uh, initiatives. Yes, there's also incentives, and you often see um, companies, other members of the regulated community lauded, but increasingly there are also blacklists. And the procurement initiatives I wanted to focus people on, um, yes, there's some problems with them because often how you get from one list to another 
is still fairly opaque in terms of uh, uh, you know being um, uh, subject to clear rules, but the fact that you must comply with things or you don't sell to the Chinese government, which is a quite a quite a large entity, mm -hmm. does have a different kind of incentive. Just as a lot of um, corporation supplier programs, you know, if you do not adhere to these rules, you know, you do not get contracts, those are also having an effect. You know, there's a definite role for the government, but all of these together um, are, are hopefully having a transforming role on the, the group. And I would say, Someone else who's written a lot about the sort of, in the Asian context, the, the using other tools, moral suasion, not quite the Singapore, you know, wear the yellow jacket and be on public TV at night, but the, uh, although that has an aspect, but this kind of entity is Tony Aposa, who you may know from the Philippines. Yeah. Um, I just want to jump in, prerogative of the chair. Um, I've, and I think this is mainly for Ted. A few years ago when I had a group of, of U.S. And, and Chinese, we were looking at water conflict resolution in the U.S. and China, comparing mechanisms or if there were any. And when we met with in MEP, at that point there was a woman in charge of the water office and said that they were considering some kind of regulation or law or something about transboundary water pollution conflict resolution because there is a lot of interprovincial water mm -hmm. conflicts. Have you seen, have any, have you seen any, it, it disappeared. I never, I, I don't I really. I think it disappeared. And that is, it has well, it hasn't come out. nature. That is one of the, also for the regional offices, that is one of their yeah. main intervention areas. You know, it has to be interprovincial, yeah. transboundary. And that is one of the concerns. It's like, okay, you know, those cases, as I know, talking to my pals there, don't come up that often. But, we'll, yeah. you know, it's not, it's definitely not that the regional offices are going in and say, EPB, bad, you're not enforcing your role. They're more, they have a limited C -tow. C -tow. set of um, conditions um, under which they can intervene. But that is the way they get in also. I mean, yeah. when we were talking to the Ministry of Environmental Protection, who we were working with a long time ago, you know, they asked the World Bank and others to help you know, understand other structures, why should, you know, they want to obviously promote why they should be a cabinet level entity, not just in the seat back there, you know, whispering over the shoulder of the cabinet member saying, don't forget us, don't forget us, um, uh, uh, was because, uh, and obviously it was a lot of jealousy among the cabinet group because they knew, you know, the development agencies and others in particular, um, that, you know, environmental controls can put some stops on what they want to do. That is the same in most countries where you have this, you know, rise of the environmental authorities. When they reach the, when they finally succeed in getting to this ministry level uh, uh, position, a lot credited their new administrator, who was indeed a politician from way back. We had so many years, you know, Chu Ping. Others who were technocrats. They knew environmental issues. They had, you know, born and bred on them, uh, really enjoyed these things. But, you know, they do, they did form an important role and still do. Yeah. Indeed, Xi Jinping still at the National Development Reform Commission, a very powerful entity, of course. But, but uh, this political understanding, I think, helped seal this deal. And, and in doing that, there was the political sensitivity that we don't want to reach too far. We know we have to fix the um, vertical issues with the ministry, but if we start reaching for that, they're going to pound us back to, mm -hmm. to the <laughs> next, to the last age um, when we when we don't do this. So it's a very pragmatic approach. We we become a cabinet level ministry, then we have to deal with these other structural issues, and indeed everything is highly political there, interagency politics, but also the subnational national government issues. Um, and I see that as hopefully being something that they'll address soon. And if, if you think that the law can affect this, you know, one place to deal with that transboundary water pollution issue is to put a strong provision in the permitting regulations yeah. giving the That's downstream state some kind of a role when the upstream uh, province is writing its permit. Yeah, I mean, right now there's just this very informal when there are water conflicts that the government, the next level up, can just kind of come in and you know make everything harmonious. But it, yeah. it's very ad hoc. Yeah, but there, it's, it, yeah, it's yeah. been one of the areas where the Ministry of Water Resources folks have also had a lot to say. And oh yeah, the water area They're in China powerful. is a fair people that focus on it with the Ministry of Agriculture and others involved. Uh, needs work. But you know, the, the, the zero hour incident, Jennifer, the zero hour incident. 
Is the ADR Chinese? This is the Chinese style of uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the up the upstream yeah. downstream pollution. Yeah, they yeah. sunk the boats and finally <laughs> they get the attention yeah, of yeah, the uh, it, officials to solve. You know. Yeah, but it's all very. It, you know, it usually takes again. It gets often gets violent at the local levels, and and yeah. everybody has to call in Beijing, which right. is just not the way to solve things. Okay, I've got one, two very quick, quick uh, very short here. Okay, you t you and you. Okay. Yeah, very short. Hey, uh, uh, oh wait, for, oh, first I'm him and then you. Sorry. I'm sorry. We'd save time doing simultaneously, but we'd all get muddled up. <laughs> so, yes. Okay, you go first, gentlemen, and then her. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, Cha Chen, freelance correspondent. Uh, I'm very, very late, but from the question and answer, I, I understand what issue uh, discussed here. I think all the issue, it won't do any good because it's uh, after f uh, fact. Uh, what I think need is this, uh, you, you need to have a government infra infrastructure. And uh, just the US, use the U.S. for example, we reach today is in almost 50 years making. In the 1960s, we have student movement to protect environment, so we create EPA. And then in the 70s, not many people know, we have protect the human resources uh, movement and we create the OSHA. And then also we do extensive education. And in the whole country, we created many, many schools of public health. So from all this, we can reach today. Thank you. OK. Yeah, other question. And you'll have to go online and check the PowerPoints, because they did actually cover some of the points of some of that foundations being started in China as a trend. Yes, in the back. Hi, I'm, I'm Susan Weld from Law Asia at Georgetown Law School. And my question is about institutional question, really. I've read something about green courts in regional areas. And I wonder if they're helpful in reducing the gap, because they do reduce the physical gap between the center yeah. and the region, which has the particular problems. Thank you. The, the green courts. The green courts, I mean, what do you, what do you want I to say? I haven't. Um, Dr. Zhang, who I work with, has been more focused on that. But uh, I do know Kunming recently set up, just last year, the Green Police Force. And I also know about the MEP has its training program for, for judges to deal with things such as causation, other, other issues. And, and indeed, we have um, um, our colleagues, in, such as Wang Sanfa's organization, who are helping train uh, and testing. Um, not testing in the academic sense, but testing the understanding of judges and improving their um, ability to receive these challenging environmental cases. But I'll have to, I'll get back to, um, I'll check with Hong Jun and get back to um, Jennifer with the Green Courts issue, because yeah. I know that he's been involved in the training. We did actually, we do actually have a new, um, we have, I mean, if you don't know, we have these, these research briefs that we put up online. They either we generate and talk to other experts or we're getting some outside people to write. It had the couple of folks from the Vermont Law School program, the USAID program, that they did. We do have a research brief online that does talk a bit about, about these green courts. And, and we had the Vermont folks here last fall also talking about, I mean, one thing that I took home was it was interesting the five courts that had been created before the Kun Kunming ones on the way, yeah. is that they were initially set up to try to address we just talked about the kind of the regional, you know, water issues, and and in fact, most of them have ended up just doing on forestry, and and there's that they 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 have kind of have a mandate, but it's all very new and very unclear. So yeah. it's kind of like I think of like like a, a wallflower in waiting, you know. That again, it's like a lot of the trends that I think I'm seeing is that there's a lot of these foundational things happening, but we're still missing a piece. How's that? I'm like, you can say, you're saying like this woman is so not a lawyer. Um, do I have another question? Well, it's better to call them perhaps greening courts. Greening the right. courts. Yeah, I think there's more greening the courts and that we're going to see more progress there. Some other Jenna, if I could just add, I, I also saw when, when we were there, we saw a great deal of interest in making greater use and more systematic use of alternative dispute resolution techniques yeah. mm -hmm. for environmental conflict resolution. So I think you have interesting developments here, both in terms of green courts and also in terms of uh, environmental conflict resolution. Yeah, well, point, uh, uh, Wuhan uh, Finance, Economics, and Law has been doing a database of collecting all the cases, not to green courts, but all the yeah. environmental cases. I don't know if it's out yet, but that should be a very interesting uh, resource. Yeah, they have a beta version already. Yeah, you got a beta, yeah, okay. Does, Shea Gong, did you, were you raising your hand or just, no, okay. One final super uber, uh, we should have a law student from, you're, you're from the NRDC. Oh, grab the mic, please, because we're in Webland. No, 
I'm interning in NRDC. I'm from yes. Tsinghua University Law School. So you're and close I, this out. I'm interested in stormwater pollution. As I know, uh, uh, US EPA started, started uh, addressing this, this pollution since 90, uh, 1980s. But still, in China, I hardly saw any legal response to this issue. So I, I wonder if you, you could elaborate more on this, this point. And the second question is, uh, as you talk about plan, planning issue, um, uh, I have this question for Dan. What do you think of the city and rural planning law is issued last year? Uh, because I heard that um, since that law re uh, release, uh, part of the plan uh, can be enforced. Not the goal of the plan, but some part of it. So uh, although you, you mentioned that the goal um, cannot be enforced, uh, kind of cannot be enforced, but um, I, I think, yeah, uh, the goal tend to be tend to be hard to tend to be hard to meet to some extent because uh, even even in Clean Water Act in the U in in the U.S. some of the some of the uh, goals cannot be met, right? So EPA t took some responsibility to to sue some states to meet the goals. So. I, I wonder if Chinese government think that uh, meeting the goal sometimes uh, we cause some embarrassment or shake the authority of the law, so they would put it in the plan rather than in law. So that's okay. my guess. So I want, want you to, to elaborate more on this issue. I think I, some succinct replies, and then I think I'm going to invite you to gently tackle these guys at the end to get more details. And also it makes me say that we probably should have another meeting later in the year because obviously the trends are more than just a two-hour session. Okay, who's going to go after it? Stormwater? Well, on, on stormwater, as, as luck would have it, our water guys are meeting right now with the Beijing Water District folks over next door. Wow. So I don't think we have any water folks to answer that question, but maybe afterwards we can, we can find. But, you know, we, we are moving away. We are uh, in the cities that have the old systems where the sewage – and stormwater combined, we're trying to move away from that now. Uh, but we, we can find somebody else to give you more detail on that. We do have an enforcement initiative on that right now. In the U.S., we have an enforcement initiative on stormwater. Yeah. But in China, don't know if, yeah, that, does that ring a bell, Ted, of stormwater it's, it's being? It's evolving. I mean, there are a lot of, could, we were just talking about how there's a lot of, obviously that's often wrapped into your, environmental impact permit, so to speak, calling it a permit, your statement. But there's also, I think, something that is coming up to address this. Um, I was just going to say that this feeds into um, your point, Dan, about the plan, you know, the, the 11th five-year plan. I would suspect I've never seen anything in the laws about stormwater mm -hmm. management. However, in the 11th five-year plan, there are targets for certain lakes and rivers mm -hmm. for cleaning them up. And if, in fact, that is one approach that's needed to clean them up, I think you'd see it selectively. I think I've seen it at the local level, too, but, I, I mean, actual programs and, and rules. But that, that's something I have to check on. Okay. On the plan, I think this is a case where I feel very virtuous. I can refer you to three experts who are all Tsinghua connected. First, a Chia, uh, who had been the senior environmental with Huan Gong at the Gong Gong Guanli, now is at the Energy Foundation. But I've had a number of conversations with him about this role in urban planning. Two, Liu Jilin, who's a new associate professor, got her PhD in Cornell on urban on, in the Cornell Planning School. And so what I've learned from her is you think the five-year plan and all those subsidiary plans are the sum total of China planning? No. And so what, one of the things she can talk about is the, you know, how all, who, who puts all these things together, if anybody, the urban plan, the five-year plan, the environment plan. Uh, she would be a good person at uh, Tsinghua Public Policy. And finally, Li Wangxin, who I may have met through you, you many of you know, she did her PhD thesis on was the Green Watch, the, uh, what was it? Yeah, the Green, Green Watch. And, and Green Watch, and she did the two case studies were Hohat, I think, and, and, uh, and Jiangsu. And Jiangsu, and, Zhang, and her basic thesis, it was on uh, policy entrepreneurs, was that they only got someplace in Jiangsu because someone pushed it. In Hohat, um, what they found was that the number one uh, polluter, the black 
was the big dairy company, so they didn't publish it. Yeah. So yeah, you know, it, whether right, there's we know probably as in America, we should add, uh, we've got government incentives not to be embarrassed. Okay, I want to thank. Okay, one more round of applause for these guys. It's, it's not often, I mean, usually, I mean, I actually think sometimes my speakers tend to be pretty good, but rarely do I get like three that really integrate and they, they mention the title I've used, Mend the Gap, again and again and again. So it's good. So it was a good title. I've been wanting to use that title for years and I kind of made them take it. I'm like, Those I of want you this out title. There, please come to Washington to participate physically if you're still out there on yes, the web. Can yes. you say that? Yes, come, come, come. Um, I also want, need, want to thank um, the funders of the China Environment Forum, USAID and Rockefeller right. Brother Fund right now, that they're our supporters and, and all of you guys. Um, um, do note, we will be sending out an in, uh, information in another week. We're having a meeting on February 12th on climate, water, and the Himalayas. Hot topic. Thank you very much, and come often. Bye. <laughs> come often. Don't